Yeah. 
Happy Ramada was doing his contribution to this debate. Do you know what the response of the Attorney General was? He stood up and he said, yes. Yes. The police were ready. Ten hours after, Keith Rowley was telling you, they wanted five years. The police wanted five years. We were not prepared to give the police five years. And then after that, after the vote, the PNM became desperate because they realized they had to justify what happened in the parliament. And you know what they did? They went out and they decided to do their smear campaign. And what they did, they did a video. I want to see, let, let the people see the first video. Look at the screens and look at what the PNM did in answer. This is very draconian legislation. Okay, I, I just, what I want to tell you is, isn't it correct to say that this, uh, uh, by you, you were explaining all this issue about the sunset legislation and so on. Isn't it correct to say that the UNC is just playing politics? That basically, you would come here, whether yourself or anybody else, and find what sounds like perfectly sensible reasons for not supporting it. But you all went in the parliament with the full intent, one of you personally, because you're not a member of the lower house, but the UNC's position was that you all were never going to support this. That's the best that, it, that, that was the best that the PNM could come up with to attack us. That's what they wanted to show the population, to support them. But let me show you, let me show you now what they didn't want you to see. Right? Play the second video. Watch what they didn't want you to see. But the UNC's position was that you all were never going to support this. As if that was correct, that could easily be tested. If that was not correct, why would we put and sit there? We didn't simply wait for the conversation. Just to be seen to be no, no, playing no, your part. No, 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 the country. no, no, not at all. Listen, when the leader of the opposition came back for this debate and stood up and made her contribution to the debate, she started off her contribution by telling the government, listen, despite all that has happened, despite our reservations about the legislation, despite the fact that we don't trust you as a government, we are prepared to assist you in this matter. We are prepared to give you that time. And ironically, just before the leader of the opposition spoke, the member for St. Joseph spoke, and Mr. Dial Singh said, he said, I want the next speaker. At that time, the leader of the opposition wasn't in the parliament. He said, I want the next speaker to get up and tell us what it is you want to pass this legislation. And the leader of the opposition appeared, got up, and she told, and put it in writing, put it in writing to the government that we will support the legislation. We wanted two things. We wanted the, the Sedition Act out of the schedule of fences, and we wanted a sunset clause in for two years. That was it. At one o'clock in the morning, first, at yeah. one o'clock in the morning, Listen. while the, uh, Dr. Tiwari was explaining to the government why, what was our reason for wanting this? Let us meet, let us compromise. The leader of the opposition started off by saying, wanted 18 months. Then she said, all right, if you want time, we'll go up to two years. The Prime Minister at one o'clock in the morning, look at the newspaper today and you yeah. see what he said. It's right there, yeah. right? You know what he said? It's one o'clock in the morning. I, well, I saw the, well, you saw it? I, it's one o'clock in the morning. Okay, okay said, we're not compromising. It's four years, take it on. A, first, listen, but the reason why we're in this position, uh -huh. right? Dr. Rowley spent two hours yesterday. I have 20 minutes. Yeah. The reason why I'm in this position is because of the attitude of the Prime Minister. And let me tell you something. What is it the attitude of the if Prime the Minister? Attorney General uh -huh. had his say in this matter, I am sure, I am sure that the Attorney General would have agreed to the two years. But you know what? It was one o'clock in the morning. We had no time. That's how it is. That is what it is. But it, it is, is his way or no way. And soon, Dr. Rowley will have to hit the highway because we're not taking it his way. Because I can tell you, the, the opposition acted responsibly in this matter. We were prepared to support this legislation. The leader of the opposition was prepared to support this legislation. But it is because of Dr. Rowley that today that legislation is not passed. And nothing he says is going to change that fact. It is because of him leading the government that they rejected the position of the opposition in this matter. And it brings me no comfort to tell you, Dr. Rowley cannot make any more excuses. The country has seen him for what he is. As we were coming here this afternoon, we got news. Another police officer has just been killed. We have had 471 murders for this year, and they want to blame that on the UNC. We've had more than 1,000 murders since Dr. Rowley.
became, became the prime minister of this country, and he wants to blame the UNC for that. You cannot blame the UNC. The UNC is not in government. And the people are tired. They are tired of the attitude of Dr. Rowley. They are tired of the arrogance, and they are tired of what he is as a prime minister. Can you imagine that in the last three days, not many people have picked it up. Dr. Rowley, Faris Arawi, and the Minister of National Security, all three of them, you know what they have been doing for the last three days? Every single time that they speak, you know what they're saying? We have information. We have information that it was gang-related activity in the airport. We have ga information that it's gang-related activity when this one is murdered or that one is murdered. You know how they get that information? They get that information by sitting as members of the National Security Council of this country. That is confidential information that is shared among only those members. And it is a most irresponsible act for the Minister of National Security, the Prime Minister and the Attorney General to come into the public domain and disclose information that is provided to them by the security people in this country. It is the most irresponsible thing that you can do. And that act by itself demonstrates to you the inability and the incompetence of Dr. Rowley and his government. Faris al Rawi told us, Faris al Rawi went and said, he said one murder, one murder is enough to trigger the anti-gang legislation. One. This legislation expired since August of last year. We've had over 400 murders since August of last year. And they come this week and tell us they want to pass anti-gang legislation. When the leader of the opposition asked for the figures, the leader of the opposition asked the government, they say, produce the figures. Produce the figures and show us how this legislation is going to work. You had the legislation there from 2011 to 2016 for five years. You know when Stuart Young got up and produced the information, what it showed? Between 2011 and 2016, when you had the legislation in place, the gang murders were increasing every single year. And when the legislation lapsed in 2017, the gang murders went down. So how could the figures support that legislation? How? They have no answer when you ask them that. The, the Minister of National Security stood up in the Parliament on Friday, thundering, talking about the airport and its gang-related activity in the airport. I want to ask Dylan tonight, if it was gang activity in the airport and we had passed the bill on Friday, he was going to prosecute people under a bill that wasn't law when the airport, when the airport heist take place? But what is more important, you know, the PNM is so convenient. They want to put the blame on the UNC for the robbery of five million in the airport. But they're not talking about the robbery of the 75 million at Petrotrin. You don't want to talk about that. Real gang activity going on at Petrotrin with real PNM in the real gang. But Dylan don't want to talk about that. Up to today, up to today, after an internal audit report and two external audit reports, the gang that was carrying out criminal activity that cost this country $75 million is still not being held accountable because they belong to the PNM. And that is the real reason why crime cannot stop under the PNM. Because the PNM, the PNM have always had a reputation of being in bed with the criminal element. It is the criminal element that put them there. Who, who took Boki and carried him up in the president house? The UNC? Who put him there? You cannot solve crime. It is Dr. Rowley. It is Dr. Rowley who told us when he was a leader of the opposition that a government that cannot solve crime is part of the problem. So I hope for all which is Dr. Rudal Munilal. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thought the class was introducing Barry there. Good evening, good evening all. 
political leader, the Honorable Kamla Prasad Bissessa, colleagues at the head table, members of parliament, members of the local government fraternity, brothers and sisters of Pinal Debe and surrounding areas, brothers and sisters and friends listening on the radio frequencies and television, a big welcome to the Paragon Indoor Sporting Facility at Debe Junction, built by the People's Partnership. Let me, in the beginning, I must let you know that Paragon Sports Club is a historic sports club in Trinidad and Tobago and in South Trinidad, operating for over six decades. And it was, it was when we were in office, they came and make representation to have a home, to have a building, to have a space for the children and the young people and the not too young people of this area. And it was the partnership government that invested and built this facility that you're sitting in here tonight. The PNM would never have done that. They would never have done that because they do not consider the people of this region and the people of these areas as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. This is why Terry Dial Singh, a few days ago, made one of the most outlandish, even by his standards, he made one of the lowest and most crass statement ever by his very low standards when he said as a racist comment parroting others that we built the children hospital for our people in Coover. Could you have believed that? So when we turned south to build the Point Fortin hospital, who we, did we build it for? It was for our people in Point Fortin. When we turned south for the Arima Hospital, it was for our people in Arima and the East West Corridor. When we built a health center in Karanage, it was for our people in Digo Martin. Terry Dial Singh said that. Imagine we built a hospital for the children for Point Lisa's industrial estate. So if your, your family, your friends, our citizens are burned to in an industrial accident in Point Lisa's, in five minutes they can get to a hospital. That devil, Terry Dial Singh, say we build that for our people. But this is the lowness that they have reached. Brothers and sisters, this country today has collapsed. It is murder and mayhem. Gerard Ramdeen told you, a police officer murdered minutes ago. Today this country is unrecognizable from the paradise that Kamla Prasad Bissessa left in September 2015. It is, it is like a Hollywood movie every day. A great escape one day, a great heist the next day. Did you follow the parliament? The minister of national security said, he said if we did vote for the anti-gang bill on Thursday, that would have prevented the robbery on Wednesday. That is what they're saying. Today, everything would have been good if the anti-gang bill would have passed. It is only a matter of time before that clung the Al Singh would tell you that if we had passed the anti-gang bill, we would have solved the problem of dengue. This is what they are doing. They are trying to tell the population that the opposition is in charge. We are not the government, we are the opposition. And last week, Thursday, it was the proudest moment in my life as a UNC child when Kamla Prasad Bissessa and our team stood up on behalf of the people. On that fateful day, in the wee hours of the morning, they intimidated us to betray the people. They harassed us to betray the people. They bullied us to betray the people. But Kamla Prasad Bissessa and your UNC team stood up in defense of the people and said, no, we will not betray the people of Trinidad and Tobago. You see, they want us to give them more power. A few days ago, they have a WPC. She represents a constituency, Aruka Maloney. Aruka Maloney. She represents Aruka Maloney. We call her the WPC. Now, when you reach she age, and you're still at WPC, you should call Anand Ram Logan because they're discriminating or you're incompetent. Brothers and sisters, she stand up in parliament 
and reading search warrant as if she's a constable and they're telling us we must give them more power so they can abuse power so they can kick down your door and search your premises without a warrant and then they say you have a ta you have a you have a tattoo you have a tattoo on your lap so um, you're a gang member that's what they want they'll come and say we see a tattoo on your lap so use a gang member and they break down your door that is the power they want and they want that power for years and we stood up and told them no tonight brothers and sisters like Jared Ramdi and I tell Keith Rowley if you want cooperation if you want help get some blasted manners and come back to the parliament because the parliament is not Balize house you can't cuss nobody there you can't bully nobody you can't charge uh, uh, nobody he thought he'd come in Parliament to deal with Harry Ragunanan. Brothers and sisters, we stood strong. And today, Trinidad and Tobago must be proud of the opposition leader and the United National Congress. It was one of the proudest days of my life as a member of the UNC. Brothers and sisters, today, some of you may not have followed the Parliament at a joint select committee meeting. Arnold Pigott a former government minister, a former high commissioner to Canada, former chairman of the EFCL board, went to parliament today. Do you know what he told parliament on the public record? He said when he was the chairman, there was political interference in the EFCL. He said they were producing fake invoices. Well, you hear about fake oil. This is now fake invoices at the Ministry of Finance. They were determining who are the contractors. He, today he went on public record and he identified the Minister of Education. That is the fella, he could do an advertisement for a mattress. I mean, by sleeping, I don't mean anything else, by sleeping. He always sleeping in parliament. He identified the acting attorney general, a cabinet minister who is not my friend. Huh? A cabinet minister said there's called Stuart Young the octopus man because he have his tentacles in every ministry and every division and every department like an octopus. Today, Arnold Pigott said that Stuart Young, acting attorney general, it must be him, directed the EFCL board to give contracts for who to build schools. That is now public record. I call upon the all-purpose Five Roses Minister, Stuart Young, hold a press conference tomorrow and deny what Arnold Pigott said today. Deny that. Because Stuart Young, this octopus minister, has his tentacles in HDC. They were corruptly doing audits with PricewaterhouseCoopers. He cannot answer that. He has his tentacles in PTSE. The police is investigating a matter where he di directed PTSE of which contractors to pay and who not to pay. He has his tentacles in the EMBDC. And brothers and sisters, a former minister, a colleague of ours, a dynamic fighter, Devant Maraj, you, you know him. Devant Maraj filed a freedom of information request to the EMBDC. You see the EMBDC? directed by Stuart Young went, the EMBDC directed by Stuart Young went to court. They fabricate a court case at Balize House and they go into court and in the court documents they say PricewaterhouseCoopers did a study of contract administration at EMBDC. So Devon Maraj asks could we get these documents of the EMBDC under freedom of information in a letter dated 8 December 2017 from the EMBDC one Ricardo O'Brien, Chief Executive Officer acting. You know what he tell Devan Maraj? He say, what you asking for? Contract administration for 2016, 17, 2015, 2016. Please be advised that EMBDC is not aware of the existence of the required documents and no such documents are in our possession custody or power of the EMBDC. 
So what documents did they fabricate to take to court if the EMBDC say they have no record of these things? This is a very serious matter that speak to misbehavior in public office and perverting the course of justice. If you fabricate and lie and take matters to the court, even the civil court, you have misbehaved in public. Tonight, Stuart Young has some questions to answer. But it didn't stop here. Brothers and sisters, in that same matter in Parliament today, did you hear Wade Mark? Wade Mark told us something we have in our possession here. Another letter. This is an email. This is an email from balizehouse at gmail.com. Now I only know one Balize house. I don't know if it have two in the country. This country is so blight that it could have two Balize house. It has to be one. Balize house in a letter to Heather Joseph at efcl.co.tt. Balize house writing Heather Joseph. Please, as requested, see list of contractors for EFCL. And they're giving from Balize house a list of contractors. Now this looking like this for the anti-gang as well. This looking like anti-gang business as well. A list of contractors from Balize House to EFCL for your attention. What is Balize House doing supplying contractors, Orion Engineering, Precision Agencies, Central Wholesale Stores, ANNZ General Contractors, XP Engineering, Rivulet Investment Group, Fiscal Services, and they have the names and number. Mr. Piggott today dealt with this. So they accuse us. They accuse us of wrongdoing when they are committing the very wrongdoing that they're accusing us of. Tonight, brothers and sisters, that scandal will not go away. We will take it further. They are trying to deflect attention from their own wrongs. The EFCL today is a den of iniquity. It is a bed of corruption. And Arnold Piggott today bust the mark on them in Parliament, and you will follow that story. But brothers and sisters, it doesn't end here. Today, one matter again I want to raise with you. Last week, they answered a question in Parliament. I had asked in Parliament a question concerning the paving of a road in Barakpo. Some of you may not know, but there's a trace called Saunders Trace from Maruga Road to Guayaguayari. Some of you may not know that because it's not a place that does drive all around. It's in the, in the rural areas. And I asked the question, who paved that? What was the cost of paving that? And was that for use by ANV Oil and Gas Limited? Last week, they answered the question in Parliament. You know what they answered, say? Eh? They went on the public record and said that the lands surrounding Saunders Trace is a 20-acre agro-processing facility. They have agro-processing facility down there. Ministry of Trade and Industry, they're developing. Now, all I know we have down there is teak wood. And it had teak wood there 100 years from now, had teak wood down there. And that's hardwood. It had down there. It didn't have nothing down there. If you go down, down there, you have to carry flashlight, hard boots and hat and things. It had nothing down there. So they said they're developing industrial estate and the road is to be used by British Gas, APL or API, Farm Exploration, Well Services, Trinity, and here the last one, ANV Oil and Gas Limited. My brothers and sisters, today I sent people myself down on Saunders Road. I said, boy, tell me what it has down there. You know what they pay? They pave road for the exclusive use of ANV drilling. Nobody else operating down there. British Gas, the road where it's located, British Gas, no way around. It has nothing there. And brothers and sisters, that I am inviting the media to do a tour and expose this. I think our political leader, our political leader has arrived for her first visit to the historic Paragon Indoor Sporting Center. Let us rise to welcome the next Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, 
the opposition leader and member of parliament for Siparia, the Honorable Kamla Prasad Bisesa. Be safe season for Christmas. And next year will be a UNC year. We will struggle and we will fight them until we get them out of office once and for all. Long live our great party. Long live our leader. Forward ever, backward never. Thank you. Dynamic MP Rudal Munilal. Now he throws some stones and he ain't called no foul. But we will see that the chickens will be coming home to roost for this wicked, incompetent, don't know nothing Keith Rowley PNM government. I want again to recognize the presence of our political leader, the next Prime Minister of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago, the Honorable Kamala Passar Bisesa. The place is waxing warm. This Dr. Rowley and the rake and scrape government scraping the bottom of the barrel to get the tax out of you, the people of Trinidad and Tobago. But don't worry, we are ready for them. You have seen tonight by our barrage of speakers that the United National Congress is the only national party of Trinidad and Tobago. The PNM will be going back into opposition where they belong and they will remain there as long as we are united. We are UNC and we are proud. The next speaker coming to you is a dynamic woman. She was a minister of transport in the Pandey cabinet, a strong and determined leader in her own right. She led the housing drive alongside MP Munilal in the People's Partnership Government, delivering more than 7,000 houses to the people of Trinidad and Tobago, a feat that this PNM government cannot even claim to be near and they will never reach it because they have not built a single house. She will deliver the East-West Corridor for the United National Congress and she's a newly appointed, newly appointed deputy political leader of the United National Congress. Please, UNC family, join me in welcoming on stage, welcoming to deliver to you Ms. Jolene John. Thank you, Chairman Obika. Thank you so much for your kind welcome. Honorable political leader, honorable members of parliament, brothers and sisters, I want to thank all of these fiery speakers who went before me. They drop all the bombs. All right, there are no more bombs to, to drop here tonight. I mean, the place is so hot, we need to cool it down. Thank you. S Senator Mark was outstanding today in his contribution before the Joint Select Committee. We need to give him a round of applause. He, he was devastating. On Friday of last week, he called the PNM dead men walking. And it's the first time I see somebody insult people and call him a dead man. And not a, I mean, it was like a dance macabre. It was as if you were performing their last rites. I'd never seen anything like that. But today again, he got up to the plate and while they were reviewing the business of EFCL, he was again very outstanding. And um, MP Rudal Munilal spoke about that. Last week, you would have noted that the leader of the opposition and other MPs had to stand in the gap for Trinidad and Tobago when the government laid and debated the anti-gang anti bill of 2017. Now, we have great attorneys here. I'm not an attorney. And I heard who the speakers who came before me. I was listening to it. They explained the merits and the merits of the bill. In fact, the speaker who will come after me is a senior counsel. And I think sometimes we don't quite appreciate that this senior counsel graduated at the top of a class in law school. This is a real lawyer. This is not a Bush lawyer. Right? This is not a Bush lawyer. They, these people have Bush lawyers playing the fool, running up and down and playing the fool with all kind of pocket square and flowers in the lapel and all kind of foolishness. You understand? Look at a good lawyer. So just in case, I mean, you want to be convinced of it, she's coming to expand. And of course, my good lawyer is also here, Senator Ramdeen. Now I'm in management by training and practice. 
And in December of 2015, myself and eight other managers were suspended, ostensibly for the board to con um, conduct a forensic audit, and they needed us out of the way. In March of 2018, the eight managers, myself included, well, I, in fact, was fired for my tone. Now, find somebody for their tone is firing them without cause and due process. It cannot stand in principle, policy, or law. What is surprising is that in May of 2016, the attorneys of a prominent law firm who the HCC had engaged, they can't build a house, but they're engaging lawyers to pursue stupidness. to our listeners that interruption that you heard of course there was some sort of power outage at the venue and that resulted in everything having to stop for a moment until the technicians figured it out we do have on the stage at this point in time former HTC managing director Jillian Jock but you cannot say which house he has built when he built the house or when when he proposed to build to build a house so there they were they have this or they they, they have their attorneys in May after they have, they have fired us, they are asking, did you find anything in the audit that we could use as our defense? I mean, something has to be wrong with these people. Now, all of this has relevance because I was looking at the Minister of Energy respond to a motion brought by Senator Mark last Friday relative to the fake oil stand, scandal. Now, what I found most remarkable, that the Minister of Energy in his explanation said, there must be due process. In this case, there must be due process. And this again was reiterated by his Prime Minister in response to a question. I took note of the tag team utterances, and although I felt I knew what due process was, I, I looked it up, just to be sure. Then I started really thinking about my own and those other seven managers' due process. When we were all unceremoniously kicked out on leave, where was my due process? Now, they had a gentleman inside of Petrotrin, whilst they carried on one audit. The same gentleman sat there undisturbed when they carried out a second audit. And as far as I read in the newspaper, that gentleman is still there. So tonight I'm putting my very talented attorney on notice that we had to file a motion for discrimination. Because, I mean, to say, how you could send me home whilst you're proposing to find something, and you have a man, you have found something, not once, not twice, but you have him sitting there. Up to Friday, he was, he was still there. You see this demonstrates how the government could suddenly discover the concept of due process when it is their friends they need to protect. But if they don't like you, then they will collude with accounting firms, as MP Munilal just said, to scandalize your name, etc. Now, our political leader was well within her rights when in a reading of the bill, knowing how dangerous and manipulated this government and wicked this government is to put a stop to it. What it is or why it is this government want to break and enter into people's house legally? What it is they want to see? Do you think the government see the citizens of Beetham as being worthy of, this, of their due process? The people of Sealots, Laventil, you, you think they care about you? The people of Tobago? Where is the due process in, in, in all of this? But they are, they are touting due process for their, their friends because I think when the mark the mark the bus for them, this vehicle it has to get bigger and bigger. So it has no due process for you. For you, they want unfettered access to the Terrorism Act, Sedition Act, to lock up people for 120 days without bail or due pro this great due process. Yes, we agree that we do not feel safe in our homes or in the street. But if according to the Attorney General, they are saying they have 2,459 gang members. They know where they live. They know if they're coming down by the junction here to eat doubles. 
Now, if these gang members, as they say, are committing crimes, why haven't they locked them up consequent to the laws that are already on the books? I mean, murder is a crime. It was a crime 10 years ago. It was a crime 20 years ago, and we're persecuting people for murder. You know, I'm saying we need good laws, as our political leaders say, on the book, not laws that you could use sleight of hands to persecute people. Because all the, we have seen these people, and as Senator Ramdin said last week, Friday, when they show you who they are, believe them the first time. And these people have shown us who they are. They, are, they like to persecute people, they are manipulative, and they are corrupt. And we ought not to give them additional tools to persecute the people of Trinidad and Tobago. It is just dead wrong. Locking up someone for 120 20 days without bail is suppression. And it does not solve anything. Because when they come back out, the, 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 the situation is, is still there. As Pre um, President Obama said, the best time to stop crime is before it even starts. If we make investments early in our children, we will reduce the need to incarcerate these kids. Now, we know how much money the People's Partnership government invested in early childhood. Now, they have stopped that program, haven't they, um, Dr. Gopi Singh? They have stopped the program, you know. And that is a time when children are at their formative years, when we teach them good manners and civility and how to love their neighbors as, they, as, as themselves. They have taken that program away. So when you take away all these, these um, safety nets, all these programs that are going to help those, the least amongst us as it was, the anti-gang bill will not magically take the place of, good, of a good preschool. We have to continue to build trust between law enforcement and the communities. Justice is not just only the absence of oppression, it is the presence of opportunity. Justice is giving every child a shot at a great education, no matter what address they were born into. Justice is giving everybody willing to work hard the chance at a good job with good wages, no matter what their name is, whether it's John or Diyoki Singh. You understand? Whatever their skin color or wherever they, wherever, they, wherever, they, wherever they live. Now, I want to wrap up. I think I only have seconds here by telling you, yes, I know it's time. So, the, the problems we have are so deeply ingrained and hopelessness is really leading to desperation. And as I said before, we are not romanticizing this crime and this gang and so on. It is a pest and we really need to get rid of it. So we live in, and we know we live in a society where your worth is measured by what you have. And a lot of our folks have nothing. For those living in neighborhoods racked by violence, when you are nothing, you have nothing to lose. And they have decided that they are going to find something. Ladies and gentlemen, the next speaker who will be introduced, I am sure will tell us Oh, how we are going to find our way out of this morass that this government has placed us in. I really want to thank you very much. A uh, round of applause for Ms. Jolene John. Brothers and sisters, five years ago, the Honorable Kamala Prasad Bisesa led the best government this country has ever seen. She led a government for every person in this country. She led a government that gave rise and meaning to the saying, every creed and race find an equal place. But what Kamala Prasad B. Sessa did, she gave young people opportunity. She gave, she gave young people a chance in politics. And tonight you will hear from one of those young people who are leading the charge in politics. You'll hear from one of the most brilliant debaters in parliament. Let's welcome the firebrand MP for Princess Tong, Mr. Barry Padarat. Good evening, my brothers and sisters of the United National Congress. The Honorable Kamala Prasad Bisesa, our political leader, best prime minister, leader of the opposition, and soon to be prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago again. My parliamentary colleagues, members of the national executive, brothers and sisters. We soon approach Christmas. Christmas is known to be a very joyous time, but there's very little to celebrate and be joyous about under this rowley led administration. But you, the UNC members, have given us something to celebrate. They say there's always a silver lining. Just a few weeks ago, with over 20,000 votes, 
Kamla Prasad Sessa was returned as a political leader of the United National Congress. My brothers and sisters, that mandate that you have given to our political leader has never before in the history of Trinidad and Tobago been achieved by any other political party. Tonight, I ask you to give in your numbers a sound warning to the People's National Movement that Kamla Pasabi Sessa is alive. The UNC is alive and we are roaring and we are kicking. My brothers and sisters, just a few days ago, our political leader traveled to the Bahamas. She received the Woman of Distinction Award, which is an international award given to women who have pioneered in the field of politics, in the spheres of community service, law. And our little twin island republic, you know, I often marvel when people see our political leader in person. They always say, this little lady, but this little lady who has given us so much and continues to give not only the women and girls of Trinidad and Tobago, but all our people so much to be hopeful about. Right now you are seeing these photographs on your screens of that award ceremony. My brothers and sisters, while we in the UNC have given to this country Kamla Pasabi Sessa's award, something to celebrate, we have a prime minister who is politically impotent, a man who does nothing, a man who fights for nothing, a man who stands for nothing. You have an attorney general who is politically constipated, who tells you, hold on, hold on, hold on, it coming. That is called, Dr. Munilal, political constipation. But I know Dr. Munilal has a prescription for that. Because when he talks about follow the money, we must follow the $80 million. We must follow the $2 million in the ply board. My brothers and sisters, something troubled me very much recently in the parliament, and Dr. Munilal spoke about it. The comment that Dial Singh made was that we built that children's hospital and his exact words was for all your people. All your build that hospital for all your people. I always count myself very lucky to have worked along Mrs. Kamala Pasabi Sessa when she was prime minister. And I can tell you, the first child that was helped under the children's life fund under prime minister Kamala Pasabi Sessa was signed off at 10.30 in the night. And that child did not come from Coover. That child did not come from Penal. That child came from the Beatum. But Kamala Pasabi Sessa does not see black. She does not see white. She does not see red. She does not see African. She does not see Indian. She does not see Chinese. She sees every creed and race has an equal place in Trinidad and Tobago. My brothers and sisters, I want to leave you with a story before I bring on our honorable political leader of a 10-year-old boy who wanted nothing more than a bicycle for Christmas. And many of you parents, you know when you want your children to do very well, you will promise them the sun, the moon, and the stars. But this child was a bright little child. He always came first in test. But he came from a broken home. His mommy worked for $150 a week. And that child came first in test. But on Christmas morning, when he opened the gift, it was not the bicycle he was expecting. It was a little vest with a bicycle on it. 
That child got the opportunity to go to a secondary school built by Kamala Pasad Bisesa because she knew the value of education. That child then went to university because of Kamala Pasad Bisesa. We had dollar for dollar. Today, that, that child stands in front of you as a member of parliament for Princess Town. My brothers and sisters, I tell you that story because in all of the darkness, in all of the despair, this Christmas, let Kamala Pasad be Sessa and the UNC be your ember, your light of hope. That is what she represents to us, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, but more so the young people who will have to stand on your shoulders and take this country forward. Tonight, that is why I support Kamala Pasad Bisesa and the United National Congress. It is with great honor, pride, and pleasure to introduce to you the woman who has given this country so much and to the young people of Trinidad and Tobago and who will carry the mantle forward as we take back Trinidad and Tobago, our political leader, the Honorable Kamala Hassan Bisesa. UNC family. Good evening to all of you. I don't believe that it was only on Friday, late Friday in fact, that we decided that we'd have our meeting here tonight. And in two days, look at the UNC people. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing with us tonight. And it is very, very important for us to meet and have this conversation. And that's why we dubbed this meeting, Let Us Talk Now. Because we have a government of spin doctors led by the biggest spin doctor, Spin Doctor Rowley. And so we felt tonight we should share with you what has been happening, not just with the anti-gang bill, but with other matters that this government has been engaged in. Barry gave you that story, I, cry, I almost cried. I didn't realize he was talking about himself. But I knew there were many, many children in our country. When Christmas comes, such a holy, blessed time of the year, that not every family can give to those children who wait for Santa. And that is why for every year I was in government, I held toy drives across the length and breadth of Trinidad and Tobago. Now we have Spin Dr. Rowley and Scrooge, who will give nothing to anyone, but who will rake and scrape every last cent they can find from people in this country. You know, I went to the Bahamas, Barry, shared with you a wonderful experience I was very honored on behalf of Trinidad and Tobago to collect that award. And whilst we were there, I'm in the car, driver driving. I said, you know, in Trinidad, we have parang, we have soca, we have um, chutney. Yeah, soca, tasa, we have all kinds of music, music of Trinidad and Tobago. What is the music here in the Bahamas? What type of music is your favorite? And the driver told us, he says, rake and scrape. That's their music. I say, you know what? That reminds me of the government in Trinidad and Tobago. Because they're raking and scraping with every tax. Anytime they could to rake and scrape from you. So let's, let's talk now. Let us talk now. I saw the Honorable Prime Minister, Spin Dr. Rowley, in the parliament last day giving something called a personal explanation. Now, if you know the Parliament standing orders, as the Speaker should know, 
When Rowley was reading his personal explanation, I saw MP Monilal, MP Gopi Singh, several of the MPs, were, they were objecting. Because a personal explanation is something personal to you. And you must not raise any controversial matter. But this spin Dr. Rowley, giving his personal explanation, and all I could say to him is stop being a crybaby. He was crying, weeping and wailing and gnashing his teeth that the leader of the opposition, other members of the opposition, that we were assassinating his character. I said, good Lord, look where we reach. Dr. Rowley, spin Dr. Rowley, you do not need my help or the help of the opposition to assassinate your character. You're doing a good job all by yourself. All by yourself. And you will remember, you will remember in the years we were in office, character assassination of the worst kind. There's a drug and mannequin all over the streets. You all remember that? Let us not forget, you know. I must admit it was a good looking mannequin, by the way, so. <laughs> Halfway. And this is a man, this is a spin Dr. Rowley. Every time he speaks, insults someone, assassinates a character of others, and he come to cry like a little baby because we were standing up for what was right with respect to the anti-gang bill, says we assassinate in character. A big crybaby in the parliament last day. And you will remember this is the prime minister, the spin doctor, who he tells women, he goes to a conference and he tells them, peel cassava. You remember that? This is a man stands up on a stage and says, I want my money, I want my money. Do you all remember that? But telling everybody else what? Tighten your belt and hold straight. This is a spin doctor. This is a spin doctor who says some things I am afraid I will not want to even repeat here tonight. But you know those words that he uses. This is a spin doctor when I raise the fake oil matter. He said we were engaged in what? Geometry. Do you remember that? And now it turns out we were right, we were justified. As Rudy just told me, it is not the oil that is fake. Is that what you told me? The oil was real. It was, the oil was fake. The money that they've found from it and taken from it is real money. This is a man who tells you, choose your woman why, why is he, I'm not in your bedroom and so on. And this is a man who goes on national TV and this is what he says about a golf course when we was asked to explain about the golf course. Can we run the video, please? <clears throat> Can we get the video? Remember, we're coming to you live from the Paragon Indoor Sporting Facility. And what we're waiting for now is for a video to play, so we'll take the audio of that. Cooperate with us to pass any law in the parliament. Today, weeping, wailing, gnashing teeth all over. Blame Kamala, blame the opposition, blame the UNC because of the anti gang bill. But spin Dr. Rowley, we will expose you tonight. And I'll ask you if you find the right video this time. Keith Rowley lies again. You remember I told you while I was looking for it, I told you and I'd shown you the video where this man lied about 27 times in one five minutes. Well, here the lies again on the anti-gang bill. Care for yourself. When we put forward the recommendation for two years sunset clause, Prime Minister said, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Did you hear him? Did you hear him? Let me draw your Okay, I'm not doing that. And then he says, after one in the morning, put it to the vote, put it to the vote. I want to ask the Prime Minister tonight, spin Dr. Rowley. I want to ask him, why did you vote against the two-year sunset clause? Why? If this bill you say is so important, why did you vote against your own bill? Why did you sabotage your own bill? 
why did you scuttle your own bill by voting against the recommendation for two years census growth? And we needed that. We needed it because we could not allow this government the draconian powers and the uh, potential for abuse of that law for any length, longer period of time. And there you see it, there you hear it for yourself. But that's not all. Can you run the second video? Three strikes and you are out. Before we got to the parliament, the opposition was indicating through the media that they didn't intend to support the legislation. Position chief whip behind the speaker's chair and I asked Mr. David Lee what are the impediments standing in the way of your team that would cause you not to support this legislation he said one the law must not apply to the crime of sedition I said okay so what else he said we want a sunset clause a sunset clause meaning that the law will remain in force for a specific period of time and at the end of that time the law will cease to be in force unless the parliament intervenes and extends it. David Lee writes that is totally not true. In your argument of rules, the length of the life of the sunset clause how long should the bill remain in force before it expires? How long should you give the police this power to fight gangs? When, we, when I agreed with the, uh, with the chief whip the, yes, to give the sunset clause, we said the same five years. Lo and behold, the opposition said, no, no, no. We only want, we only want to give the government, we only want to give the police this power for 18 months. Police would need the time to build the cases against the individuals who are recruiting people into gangs, who are operating gangs. If this parliament today agrees with you, because the police, as you've indicated, have given and furnished you with the names, addresses, numbers of gang, gangs and gang leaders, and I've, I'm sure with your consultation, as responsible as you are, would have inquired whether they had the quality and the evidence that is justicable to prosecute them tomorrow. I know that question and I ask the Attorney General if you can tell us that to give me some comfort. Remember, and I think you've hit the nail on the head, the answer to that in short is yes. So the short answer is yes, and I assure you, you can be comforted. The police would need the time to build the cases against the individuals who are recruiting people into gangs, who are operating gangs, to prosecute them tomorrow. So he's a liar, liar. So you see, so you see from their own words, the spin doctoring that has been taking place ever since the bill collapsed in the parliament. On the one hand, you're saying you're ready to lock them up tomorrow morning. You're ready to prosecute tomorrow morning. But the Prime Minister is arguing a case in the Parliament. We need four years for the police to build evidence. So what's going to happen from now till that four years? Take the two years. Tell us why you did not want this law enforced for the two years that the opposition recommended that we will support. Tell us why. Did you scuttle this bill? Did you sabotage your own bill? because you wanted to go back out there and say, blame Kamala, blame the UNC, blame the opposition. Their answer to every fault in this country is the blame game. But we're not taking that. We are fighting back. We are UNC and we are proud. We will expose you every step of the way. And so I ask a strong man, DT. Is DT here? Come. I need some help. Bring that box. Just put it on here. Bring the box, Didi. Just put it on there for the moment. Thank you. They won this law so badly. This will solve the crime. This will solve the murders. 
When we ask how many are gang related, they give us an answer that shows clearly when this law was enforced, it wasn't working. But what about the other laws on the statute books? What about the other laws to fight criminals? Why don't you prosecute them under these laws? Why? So tonight I just want to show you just a few of the law books I picked up. So DT will help me because they're really heavy. Anyone? They're all, they're all laws related to the criminal law of Trinidad and Tobago. So here we are, laws of Trinidad and Tobago, chapters 4 to 6, this whole volume. What of that one, DT? Chapters 7 to 9, more dealing with fighting crime. Did he hold all? We have to show all. Pick up the others. Chapters 10 to 12. Pick up the next one. Next one. You see, even DT having trouble. So we have tons and tons of law books and laws on our statute books. Right? This one is, uh, ouch. 13 to 17. And look, these are only some of the laws. You talk about one anti-gang bill that you could not compromise your, your bullheadedness, your stubbornness. You will not compromise and reach consensus with your opposition and you cry in shame. Blame Kamala. Blame opposition. Blame David Lee. So look, this is the reality today. DT Kaim all all four. And look, there are far more. There are 90 chapters of laws in Trinidad and Tobago. And in each one of those chapters, you have several laws. So you'll have chapter 10 or 2, 10 or 3, 10 or 4, 10 or 5. So when you say 90 chapters, each of those, there are others. Not all are to fight crime. I just grabbed these quickly from my shelves as I was leaving home because I wanted, there is nothing, a picture tells a thousand words, doesn't it? So look at this here. What about these other laws? So, DT, thank you. Not only can DT sing, he can also raise up the laws of land. Give me a round of applause. So, here we are on that anti gang bill. I go forward with a clear conscience. The opposition members who voted against it go forward with a clear conscience. And if anyone is to blame, I will blame Spin Dr. Rowley first and foremost. I saw an interesting thing in the parliament. A.G. Farris, you may not like him. Some of you may like him. Some of us know he's very loquacious. He talks a lot. But I saw him really try on the day for the vote to try to reach a consensus. But sitting next to him was the bullheaded, stubborn, insulting prime minister. I am not doing that. Take it to the vote. Put it to the vote. Vote now. No compromise. You don't work like that. I was a prime minister, led a bench in the parliament. And when we had special majority bills like these, you know you have to consensus, find a consensus, and you have to compromise. So we will have to take some issues, take some recommendations. And that's how, when they stand up and say they supported 96% of our law, I say, great. The reason you did it is because we brought good law to the parliament. Good law. And I want you to remember that under my government, we were able to bring serious crimes down to the lowest ever in 31 years. Do not ever forget that. So this anti-gang, this weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth all over is not going to help you, Dr. Raleigh Spin Doctor. You need to demonstrate it is not Kamala, it is not the UNC, it is not the opposition. We are not to blame. You are in charge. You stood up in the parliament to say, we are in charge now. Well, take charge and stop the blame game. I am moving away from this anti-gang because it's not, it was not going to help, but we were prepared to give them that support. Gerald would have spoken on it and others. I want to move on to something else that I find very, very worrying. And this has to do with the appointment of a cabinet committee to do what? To buy the boats for Tobago. You see, when they talk about gangs, they must look amongst themselves and they'll find the gangs right in their own government. And so they're setting up a cabinet appointed committee to go and do what? Buy a boat. 
the last time they bought a boat, the MVCU, they named it after the spouse of one of the ministers. You all remember that? How much money did they pay? I think it's about $52 million or more. And the thing never even, it just never, it just never, what's the word? Swim. It just never float. It just never floated. They brought the Cobosta and the others, same problem. But there are two things I'm going to um, raise with you on this whole ferry issue, ferry tales, ferry fiasco for the suffering of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and especially the people of Tobago. You really believe Spin Dr. Rowley cares about the people of Tobago? When you see what is happening with this ferry, the inter-island ferry, he can have no care or no heart for the suffering that is going on in Tobago. So, first of all, it is my respectful view that the appointment of a cabinet committee to buy this boat, a boat or whatever boat, is totally unlawful, according to the laws of Trinidad and Tobago. The powers of supervision of public expenditure is vested in accounting officers under the law of our land, under the Exchequer and Audit Act. That officer is answerable to the Public Accounts Committee. The Treasury and the Auditor General also have oversight of money to be spent. The President allocates responsibilities for ministries to conduct the business of government. Okay? So the President, in accordance with the wishes of the Prime Minister, you are the Minister of Transport, you are the Minister of Works and so on. You have your responsibilities. The executive authority of the state is therefore exercised by ministers in a very defined, publicized manner. There is no doubt that the cabinet does have uh, executive authority to decide matters of public importance, to decide policy, to arrange itself for that function. Under Section 75 of our Constitution, the cabinet shall have general control of the government. But that is not the role of the cabinet of a committee made up of the cabinet to go on buy a boat. That is totally unlawfully exercising power of a cabinet. That is why you have the Central Tenders Board Act. That is why in all the state enterprises you have a tender process set out in regulations. It is not a cabinet. And that in itself makes the process so opaque, so lacking in transparency and integrity because it is so easy for politicians to influence what is happening with that. Now already, Cabo Star, Cobo Star, whatever, Ocean Flower, that already, as Spin Dr. Rowley himself said, was a crooked deal. We already had interference from outside. Some are saying it is ministerial interference. We shall see. And here now, you put ministers directly in charge of buying this boat. What is going to happen? Corruption of the highest order. Corruption of the highest order will result from this. And that is why our law is very careful in providing for a procurement procedure for buying things. Under our cabinet, I don't recall us ever having to put a minister to buy even a paper clip. You cannot buy, you cannot procure. You must do it within the confines of the law. So any subcommittee of cabinet, without the technical input, with no technical capacity, you can then manipulate the specs and requirements to, to buy anything you want to buy. So for example, you know someone down the road, remember in this scandal, Rushton and Wade Mark starring as Parliament TV stars in the JSC, when asked, the, the lady from the port, she was the CEO, Charmaine Lewis. She said the minister said, look, so and so have a boat, go down and check it out. He want 11 or whatever it was, million or 12, but don't worry, we could beat him down. Already sent by somebody, just pick somebody out of a hat and send you. So you can see where they can manipulate it. Where I know Mr. John Brown, I don't know him, but someone I name of John Brown. A minister knows him, the cabinet committee, and they say, go check out John Brown. Or go check out Mary. Or go check out Leela. They can send you to their friends. And this will be totally unlawful. My team of lawyers, we are looking at this for the un unlawful, illegal actions on the part of the government of the Republic 
of Trinidad and Tobago, headed by none other than Spin Dr. Rowley. So here we are, but there's another interesting development. I am told that one of the boats now working for the ferry, on the ferry, in the island ferry, that that boat is going to dry docking sometime soon. What is going to happen is a vacuum is going to be created. And when that vacuum is created, listen, enter the red and ready, and enter who? Ocean flower. Ocean flower too parked up somewhere in our waters. Came down here even when they said they cancelled the contract. Came here, they cleaned up, they repaired it, I don't know what else they did. And just waiting quietly so that when there's none, they just slip ocean flower too and say, look, you all want ferry? Take ferry. So let's warn them we are watching you. I said we'll expose them tonight. Trinidad and Tobago is watching you. The UNC is watching you. And we will expose your actions every step of the way. So friends all, I have many other things I could speak of tonight. I know in Parliament, David Lee dealt with the NLCB Bacchanal. And some others talked about something called the Central Bank Act. Now, I'm a little older than the Central Bank Act. Huh? The Central Bank Act was passed in 1964. That is about what, 53 years ago? 53 years ago. Since that 53 years ago, the government of Trinidad and Tobago over the years, they have made in total about, I think it's about 20 changes, changing parts, changing parts of the bill. They have made amendments with subsidiary legislation. So about 20 changes over the 53 years to the Central Bank Act. Do you know up to today, or up to before the day Parliament sat, Section 46.2 has never, ever, ever changed. This government came, the rake and scrape government came, to change Section 46.2, to allow the government to take advances from the central bank, where over the 53 years it was always 15%, a portion of the estimates of annual revenue, recurrent revenue plus capital receipts, to take 15%, they came to raise it to 20%. So two things about that first before I go on. This was the same facility. Colin Imbert came in every budget debate. Every time he spoke, he said the partnership government was running on fumes. You all remember that? He said we were running on fumes. He said we had maxed out the overdraft facility. It, we could never have maxed it because we never came to increase it. This Minister of Finance, this government, has, they are running on fumes and they have maxed out the overdraft. That is why they have come to increase how much they could take in advances. That's the first thing. Unprecedented. Never happened in the history of the Central Bank Act from 1964, that act established the Central Bank of Trinidad and Tobago and with the powers and so on, functions given to it. Today, under this rake and script government, they are now going to increase the money that you owe. Every one of you in this country, they're going to increase the number of borrowings, the loans, the debt. We have definitely gone down into the valley of the shadow of debt. That's DBT. But we've also gone into the falsh the valley of the shadow of death in both ways under this wicked government. And so here we are. He wants more money. Do not know how The second thing that's unprecedented is he never mentioned this in his budget. He told us he was going to sell assets. He told us he was going to raise money, borrow money, everything. He never once mentioned that he was going to take more advances on the overdraft facility. Never said it. Whole budget debate over two weeks, then went to the Senate, never once. Comes today, it means since October, when that budget was passed, November and peace of December, the man ran out of money already. In a month and a half, two months, wants to go and increase the overdraft. I want to ask you, I think most people, you have a little overdraft. The overdraft is to help you, you know, you have a cash flow problem, it go and you overdraft a little bit, you overdraft. But you know what happens when you overdraft? your interest rate goes up very high. 
So when you are overdrafting to pay bills, then you are making more bills, you have more debt to pay. They have no sense and no plan. You ask me what would I do? I ask you to look at what's happening in Ireland. I ask you to look at what's happening in the United States. This government, I say, rake and scrape tax every single thing. Look at the US, what did they do recently? Look at Ireland, where they want sustained development, where they want growth, where they want an economy to grow and people to get jobs, where they want money to invest and to spend on goods and services needed by a population. What did they do? They dropped the taxes. So we know corporation tax is 35%, I think. They raised it to 35, am I correct? Someone? Huh? From 30 to 35. From 30% 30 to 35. Now you feel corporation tax is not you, you know. Corporation tax, yeah, the 1% will pay it, whatever it is. But you see the small and middle-sized businesses, the pressure will be on you. They will squeeze out. Small and medium-sized businesses with that 35%. But look at it another way. You want investment, man. Look what's happening in the U.S. already when they lowered their taxes. A big firm like Apple has started to repatriate money back into the U.S. Why? Because the taxes are lowered. You get more investment. Who will come to invest in Trinidad when you have to pay 35% here? Or you could go to the U.S. where you have to pay far less. So look at this. I'm saying, you know what I would have done? and found myself in this position, I will lower the taxes to bring in investment, to have repatriation, and for people to live a better quality of life. But we told you, we warned you, they have no plan. Rodney Charles, I keep telling you, was a seer man. They have no plan, they had no plan. They fooled the people of Trinidad and Tobago. They fooled them, red and ready, and now they have betrayed the good people of Trinidad and Tobago. They have betrayed all of the people. And I know now we are going into the Christmas season. Before I wish you Merry Christmas, I have one more video I really would like to share with you, if they could please find it. This is a golf course video I asked for earlier. Do you see equal defense for the golf course remark? The golf course remark again, what is that? You're taking a woman to a golf course that needs grouping. It is the element of care and attention that I was pointing to. Why does a woman the, need to be a subject of care and attention? Why? More than a man. I've never cared and attended to any man. I, I can't. But you didn't make a reference about a man's personal appearance. You made it about a woman's. No, but you see, it's all well and good for you to say that and make an issue of it. But you know, if you tell a woman she's not looking good, if she asks you how I look, and you say, you look horrible. You will know what, well, I would know what trouble I'm in. So I have, I have, I have an understanding, right? And we talk about something being angelic, you know why? Because it looks like an angel. They're male angels. I have never. Why feminize in other words? Why bring the feminine element I into never, those comments? I have never, I've heard agenda ascribed to angel, but I'm telling you, I'm saying the word angel. In the Christmas season, the, word, the, the angel word, Gabriel was on the angel, angel Gabriel, 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 she says. Virtual perfection, and right? art, yeah. beauty, grace, power, you know. So if you say, I want an angelic this, it is not that you are converting an angel into something cheap. The way that statement was meant, and saying the grooming of the golf course, and it was not a woman that will turn into a pastor. It is a golf course that will turn into a pasture if it is not cared for the way you care for a woman. Okay. So we are in the Christmas season and the reporter asked the Honorable Prime Minister about angels. He's talking about angels, you see. Out of desperation, he was trying to justify a totally objectional statement that a lot of people were unhappy with comparing a woman to a golf course. And then he goes off and he gets more and more confused and muddled. And then um, the reporter says, what about the angel Gabriel? So, you know, we're in the Christmas season and whichever religion you are, we are all happy at Christmas time. And we value the religious teachings that come with Christmas. So I'm thinking, but wait, this man said he don't know about any angel with a gender and so on. 
But every single angel is who? A male. Gabriel, look around, he's smiling. Check it, I checked it. Every single one. And I do believe one of those angels who became a fallen angel was Lucifer. So you had angel Gabriel, you had archangels Michael and so on, all of them coming down. Every time in the scriptures referred to as a he, it was never a she. I think that has become a Hollywood, um, a Hollywood sensation that we all see females and so on as angels. Anyway, but they have, there's one, Lucifer, fallen angel. Well, I believe in this PNM lineup, we might find the angel Lucifer waiting. And don't be surprised in the next election, you might have a candidate, Lucifer, polling before the whatever. So Barry just passed me and he said something called Two Hours Comedy Central. Several of the clips out of that two hour interview, Prime Minister did. I think we can put them on Comedy Central um, for all to see. I close finally on a serious note. You will recall that when I raised the fake oil issue, well, first the Prime Minister accused me of geometry, and then Mr. Baksh and um, A. V. Drillin they sued me for defamation. Since then, since then, the Government Commission, the Crawl Report, so first I had read out the internal audit report of um, Petrotrin on this fake oil issue. And by the way, I think um, Munilal might have said it tonight that um, Mr. Baksh and his son-in-law, they will constitute a gang, so they might be charged because a gang is what? Two people. So both of them are assaulted media and so on. And I read the findings of that internal report. It raised serious issues of criminal conduct on the part of employees of Petrotrain. It disclosed an intricate, premeditated and calculated plot to defraud Petrotrain of tens of millions of dollars. And Petrotrain also means you, the taxpayers. The Minister of Energy then comes and says, in the Parliament, he's a line minister for Petrotrain, and he says that um, the findings of the internal order report was confirmed not only by Kroll, but by also Gaffney, Klein, and Associates. So they have confirmed what I read from the internal report. I made an application under the Freedom of Information Act to get a copy of that Kroll report because it confirms and is in fact our defense that we were justified. It was the truth of what we raised and they have not responded to give us the report. So I've now instructed my lawyers and they have written to Petrotrin a pre-action letter to get us the Kroll report and if they fail so to do, we will go to court to take Petrotrin and to make that report public. And that report is very important, not just for me, but in the public interest for us to know what exactly went on and how you as taxpayers, how you were defrauded of millions and millions and millions of dollars. And these people are so bold-faced that the PNM candidate who fought me twice, there's reason enough not to like him, but that's not my point tonight. Fought me twice in Superior as a PNM candidate that that person remains working at Petrotrin Jail and raised it, remains as an employee of Petrotrin, even when they removed him from the Labitko board, when this issue arose, he facilitated this entire fraud. And you still have him, he went away for a few weeks. We don't know if he got official leave to go on vacation. He went away, come back. They put him in one department, I'm told, and the people just started to protest. They moved down the coming on next office and start to protest until all inside Petrograd, they are protesting. Tonight I say, we are protesting. He should be removed from the compound of Petrograd now, now, at this time. So friends all, I think this is our last meeting. We think it's our last meeting unless other things arise that we need to speak to you about. And therefore I take this opportunity to wish you all a very holy, a very blessed Christmas season. And indeed, we will meet before the new year because I'm inviting all UNC members to join us at the Fun Splash, save the date, the 30th of December to the UNC end of year cool effect. Bring your eats and drinks, join with us on the 30th. God bless you and I thank you very much. So I ask you not to leave. I ask you not to leave because we have a very important exercise to conduct. I want to thank all those of you who supported us in the internal election. All of you worked, all of you came out. And tonight, uh, 
Who is doing a generous? Our general secretary will declare officially the results of the Natex election. And ladies and gentlemen, that's where we are. Came to you live from the Paragon in the Sporty facility, David Junction, David. We thank you for being with us for the past two hours, and now we're returning to our studio. We'll continue the programming on behalf of the technical team, myself. We wish you all the very best, and of course, we'll join you tomorrow morning on the morning franchise from 6 a.m.
position that was not contested. And I want to welcome him on stage now. Serving you again as your vice chairman, ladies and gentlemen. As your vice chairman. As your vice chairman, ladies and gentlemen. His Excellency, the Honorable Clifton de Coto. He received 100% of the votes because nobody was brave enough to contest against him. For the position of party organizer, there were two combatants. Mr. Krishna Bahadur Singh received 534 votes. Returning as your party organizer, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ravi Rataram with 16,832 votes. For the position of education officer, there were two persons contesting that position. Ms. Dala Nelson Seals, she received 303 votes. And winning with 17,509 votes was Ms. Maria Margarita Rodriguez. Put your hands together for our new education officer. And ladies and gentlemen, I have saved the best for last. The absolute best. There were three combatants, as you all know, for the position of political leader. Mr. Changna Bagan received 40 votes. Mrs. Christine Niwal Hussein received 112 votes. Ladies and gentlemen, make some space, make some noise for the return of your political leader receiving 20,321 votes. The Honorable Kamla Prasad, the okay. second! Yep, yep. Thank you. 